as we go into this series tonight, our subject is on fasting. And I'm going to be reading from the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 80, 58. Um, and he talks about true fasting. Shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the descendants of Jacob their sins. For, to, for day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. We have fasted, they say, and you have not seen it. Why, we have humbled ourselves, and you have not noticed. Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please. You exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife, and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today, and expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen? Only a day for people to humble themselves? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying in sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord? It is not this kind of fasting I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. We give thanks to God for his word. Particularly those last few verses where he said, it's not this kind of fasting that I have chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free. When he talks about those things, that is what the fasting is that he's talking about. One day we went to the Mangolongolo squatter camp where we used to do a soup and bread ministry. Um, and we invited some mothers to come along that had never really seen the type of conditions and circumstances where people lived in squatter camps. And one of the mothers in, particularly, in particular was moved um, by the circumstances of the people there. It, it was quite extraordinary. She just sat there and she cried her eyes out. She couldn't stop crying. And she was vowing and declaring, and you know, it really went on for quite a long while, that she would get involved in assisting with the feeding of these people. She was going to get involved in this. She really needed to do it. We never saw her again. Isaiah had this situation in mind. He has in mind people who hide from the people when those people are in dire need. So let us begin at the beginning. These verses about Isaiah are about fasting. In general, fasting is an abstinence from food and drink. And to fast, as we see it, is to stop eating. And the fast that we mostly hear about in our world today, and, and which is m mostly in the news media, is that Muslim fast of Ramadan. Ramadan is in the ninth month of the Muslim calendar, and Muslims are supposed to fast for the entire month. They neither eat nor drink, during the day, but they're allowed to start um, having food and, and, and drink after sunset. But it's not only the Muslims that fast. F 
Fasting has been a practice in our Christian church um, from time immemorial. In the book of Acts, we read about it, where um, they tell the church in Antioch that they fasted and prayed before commissioning Paul and Barnabas and John Mark as missionaries. They fasted and prayed. And in Acts 14, verse 23, it speaks of appointing elders in the church with prayer and fasting. And if we, we follow that advice, we, when we have the election of our officers in our church, um, we should have a good period of praying and fasting beforehand. I'm not really sure if that sort of is going to be well received, but anyway. But as you can see, fasting and prayer are often linked together. And in Luke, we are told of that prophetess Anna. She was 84 years old and she was a widow. And she never left the temple but worshipped there with fasting and prayer, day and night. So what kind of fast does God want? And at this sort of point in time, you're probably wondering where my sermon is going to. In the season of Lent that, that we practice in the Christian church, Lent has been a time where we, we, where we have fasting. Sorry, let me just move this. It's getting in my way. Uh, where we have fasting and... Uh, sorry. That's what I'm doing. Uh, fasting where we have penitence, where we come and we confess our sins, and, and, and we, 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 we're doing this and we're saying this is what we're giving up for Lent. Perhaps you're thinking that maybe I'm going to give you a special diet that you can do today. Perhaps you think I'm talking about losing a few pounds during Lent. Because so many of us in affluent societies tend to be overweight especially with so many of these fast food restaurants around where you can nip in for a quick hamburger or a ration of chips. And maybe it's not such a bad idea for us to lose a few kilos. But fasting in scripture is never about losing weight. I know when I first started to do fasting, I thought, yeah, I'm going to lose weight. <laughs> Didn't ever happen. Um, fasting is about improving our relationship with God. It's not intended to punish our flesh, but it's intended for us to focus on God. And for, fasting is not just about giving up food. Christian fasting is a way of living and a way of thinking, particularly as we read in this chapter of Isaiah. And in verse 3, we hear the people complain to God, Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you don't notice? They were angry because God did not seem to be responding to their fasting, to their prayers, to their sacrifices. They thought that God should take notice of them. They thought that God owed them because they'd done all this religious stuff. And God's answer was that they combined their religious observances, their prayers, their fasting, their going to church, reading the Bible, with immor immoral lives, and that was not acceptable to God. They were living on two levels. God says, you serve your own interest on your fast day, and you oppress all your workers. You talk about fasting and praying and being so religious that you're exploiting other people. There's a, there was a story that I read at some stage about a, a Christian businessman who one day laid off a thousand employees without a qualm because he wanted to, inc um, to increase his corporate profits just a little bit. A thousand people out of work. The next Sunday, he went to church feeling very righteous about being there. In that man's mind, something was disconnected. And God says that he doesn't like disconnection. 
got to remain connected to him. In verse 4, God says, you are quarreling and you're fighting, and thus such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. The Israelites had this idea by fasting and prayer they could manipulate God. God would do their will because they worshipped God. And God wasn't having any of this. God emphasised that the true fast focuses on manifesting God's presence to others. And the lesson here is that what we do, what we do makes a difference. And we are, you and me, are responsible for what we do. We all have the abilities and potential. And God holds us responsible for the way we use our abilities and our potential. We are responsible to God for the way that we live our lives. We can't talk about being saved by Jesus on a Sabbath and then go out and live our lives like we belong to the devil. In verse 5, God asks the question, what kind of fast does God want? And God says, do you think I want a fast in which you humble yourselves and bow down like some kind of weed in the wind? Do you think I want you to clothe yourself in sackcloth and to cover yourself with ashes? And these are rhetorical questions. The Lord doesn't want some kind of religious show. But having told us what he doesn't want, the Lord then goes on to tell us the kind of fast that he does want. And he says he wants a fast against injustice. He wants a fast that's against oppression. And the Lord calls upon us to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. And as believers, that we should, as, sorry, as, as a believer, to do things justly, we require our government and all governments and courts around the world to be just. We have seen people over the ages who have martyred themselves in the name of justice, but we can count them very, very few. In the West, in our, in our tradition, in our countries in Europe, we have this great tradition of human rights. And we need to make sure that this tradition gets applied even in those hard ca cases where there are the people there that we really don't like. Just because we declare legal acts to enforce human rights doesn't mean that we are not exploiting people. And if we can come upon one country in this world that doesn't exploit people, put up your hands. Communism. Communism said that, that, that everybody should be treated equally and that we all should work the fullest of our abilities and share the gains of our workplace with everyone. Karl Marx, who wrote that manifesto, he was influenced by Christianity. And, and communism professed a kind of earthly Christianity. But the reality was communism treated people like dirt. Millions of people were shipped off to Stalin's gulags. Millions of people were deliberately starved to death as part of a Soviet policy for converting small private farms into communal farms. And the Soviets proved that what they were was how they did it. You might say, all right, the Soviets didn't believe in God, and that was part of their problem. It was, yeah. But there were plenty of atrocities committed in the name of God. We can remember the Taliban government. They were fundamentalist Muslims. 
who made a great profession of God, and yet they refused to let girls go to school. They wouldn't even let them learn to read or write. They oppressed women on a scale unheard of. They were evil. How do we know that they were evil? By the way they acted. Isaiah says God knows us by the way that we act. He speaks of sharing our bread with the hungry and our homes with the homeless. This is a true fast, to feed the hungry, to help those that need help. And the point is my fasting has to do with you. It has to do with your pain, with your injustice, that you are suffering with the yoke that oppresses you. My fasting has to do with the sharing of your life when you are in need. My fasting is about neighbours, my city, my world. My fasting has to do with the ones out there on my doorstep who find themselves hopeless, homeless, and they're fearful about everything and they've given up all hope. Isaiah also says that fasting is not turning away from your own family. And everyone is our own family. And surely, if we have learned one thing in this day of where we have global communications, where we have this instant messaging, is that we are all one family. And we only have one Father who is in heaven. And one of the points of Cain and Abel's narrative that we read in Genesis is that we are to watch over and care for others. We are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. In James it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food and one of them says to you, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what good is that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I by my works will show you my faith. And so what James is saying, what, what Isaiah is saying, is that the point of life and living is to be a blessing to someone else. And as Christians, we are called to imitate Christ. And the way we do this is by acting for the betterment of humankind. One person at a time. One instant at a time. Take one little opportunity at a time. Someone might say, though, why bother with any of this? It takes time, it takes energy, all this stuff to help other people. Why bother? Why not just go on my little way, living in my own little world? If we continue to read this message from Isaiah, he makes a beautiful promise. And that reveals the answer to these questions I'm asking you. And he says, Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will hear the call, you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing figure and the malicious talk, and if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. 
and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we just come before you right now and we just thank you for this opportunity that we can come to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have in this country to be amongst your family, the freedom that we can have to meet in your house. Thank you, Lord, that as we come and worship you this evening, you keep us in your warm embrace. And thank you, Lord, that you can show us what you truly want of our lives that you can show us all the hurts and the fears and the troubles that are out there, that we can bring peace and comfort and healing to. Thank you, Lord, that in the world of our concerns and fears, that we can find your peace, your wholeness, your healing, your refreshment. And so, Lord, we thank you tonight for this opportunity to worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> 